when the place that should ideally make you feel the safest turns into a dreaded space, something is awfully wrong. Home is a place that should nourish you, a place that you can be yourself. But when fear overtakes all emotions at home, it's time to stand up and speak out. One in three women have experienced physical violence since the age of 15. Statistical data show that one in four women have experienced sexual violence since the age of 15. And one in four women have experienced emotional abuse by a current or former partner since the age of 15. Today, as M4TV pledges to do our bit on uh, raising awareness against domestic violence, we have with us two community partners from Vitrupin, Penelotha and Ajay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at Studio M4 today. Thank you. Thanks, thank Shama, for you, having Shama. us. We also have uh, Dr. Primna joining us online today. Penny, uh, right. they say that on an average, um, one woman is murdered by her partner or spouse or previous partner every uh, week. That's drastic and that's horrifying. Uh, what are the kind of domestic violence that uh, one faces? Like we, we understand the term domestic violence, but what are the different kinds of violence that one can you know, experience at home? Thank you, Shama. That's a really good question. So um, there are different types of abuse that happen preceding physical violence and then the absolute worst case scenario is homicide, which is what you just described, that one woman a week is killed by a current or former partner. That's the current statistic in Australia. So some of the red flags that we should look out for are things like coercive control. So, for example, your phone might be being tracked or you might be followed on social media, you might be getting unwanted attention. Uh, you might observe in your friend that um, they've changed the way that they dress or you might also see that they are isolated so you're not actually um, able to visit them anymore or they've just become very distant. Um, uh, you might also notice that there's financial control in the relationship. So basically one of the people, your spouse or your partner, is making all of the decisions around finances and um, they might sort of coerce you into leaving your job so that you become completely dependent on them financially, which creates a power imbalance and makes you, as the woman, um, uh, disem disempowered, which means that you, you don't feel like you can you can leave the relationship because you don't have the resources to do it. So there are many examples of red flags that we see in relationships um, that, that, are, that exist prior to that worst case scenario of physical abuse and that statistic of homicide, which is one woman a week being killed by a current or former partner. Isn't it very strange because what you just described is uh, domestic violence, uh, you know, traits that, you know, we would probably just brush off as a mere act of love, um, especially coming from an ethnic background. I've, I've seen friends who would, you know, say, oh, um, uh, he's calling me because he's checking on me because he loves me. And uh, I like it that he's taking care of my finance um, and he's, he's just, you know, making sure that, you know, everything's perfect. So this, this often happens and, you know, it's often attributed to love, you know, I, I care for you, that is why I have to do this. Um, isn't that the case? Absolutely. Thanks, Shama, for that question because what Penny was mentioning about coercive control, mm -hmm. now this control is so subtle that the victim does not realize about that. Now, I've known a couple, it took her around 30 years to recognize that this was actually control and not love. For almost 30, 25, 28, 30 years, it, it was assumed that it was out of love, that all this was happening. Now, if you look at the psychology behind that, it is mainly uh, the control is there or the, the show of love is there because the perpetrator wants to ensure that everything is going as per 
uh, the perpetrator's wishes and demands and uh, likes and dislikes. And this show of love, this follow up, this uh, all that is happening to ensure that this is being done. So it, yes, it is a reality and a lot of people are not aware that this could be the reason. Now having said that, I should also say this in the same breath that there could be genuine partners, genuine couples who actually show that love. Mm -hmm. Now how do we distinguish between what is cause of control and what is genuine love? Uh, genuine love is like between two people. So obviously two people raised in two different scenarios uh, would have will agree on some points, will disagree on some points, there will be disagreements, there will be debates, arguments, all that will happen on a weekly basis if not daily or monthly, right? That is fine because one argument and then the next day you're watching a movie together, you're shopping together, uh, then again another argument, something. So there's, it goes on and off, it balances it out. Whereas in control, what happens is there is fear. This underlying psychology is fear. So the victim actually fears for to take any action, to do anything without the permission of the perpetrator. So this is how you identify. So I always, wherever I speak about uh, family violence, I also say this don't, because it's easy to misinterpret, in, misinterpret my words and say, okay, you are showing me love, that means there is something behind it. No, not necessarily. There could be some genuine good couple. Yeah, it's a very fine line between, I don't like you wearing this dress ever, and um, hey, listen, let's not wear this to this occasion, because I know the kind of people who are coming there, and I don't think Absolutely. Uh, they would appreciate it. Absolutely. I think, I think the other point is that um, there is a direct link between coercive control and homicide, but coercive control doesn't always result in homicide. So that's why the red flags are important. Okay, so in every homicide, we know that these red flags existed mm -hmm. and we didn't do anything about it. Hmm. But, but you can be in this type of relationship and it not turn into a homicide. So that's, okay. that's why it's not okay. Well, Penny, violence at home and domestic violence um, usually uh, would happen when relationships go astray. And sometimes we feel that relationships go astray when uh, you know, partners don't get to communicate with each other. Like, see the lamest or the simplest of persons would uh, you know, perceive it to be that way. Uh, and at times when, uh, when the lockdown was uh, all up and everyone you know, was at home, a, play, a time when you know, most people expected to have the best of family lives because you know, everyone was at home, uh, we saw uh, statistical data reporting otherwise, which meant domestic violence was on the rise. Um, why did this happen? Yeah, that's a really interesting point that you make. We do know that, um, and the United Nations have actually reported on this as well, that during the pandemic, they actually um, named the, the, the surge in domestic violence as the shadow pandemic because globally there was a 33% increase in cases of domestic violence. Now, we believe that that happened because people who are um, staying, sometimes couples who are in relationships um, where there are issues are staying together, but because they're going out to work during the day for eight hours or 10 hours or sometimes 12 hours, the, there isn't the opportunity, as much opportunity to have that incongruence and the fighting. And then with lockdown, people were forced into their homes 24 seven in small spaces sometimes with nowhere to go, okay? And so because they were together all day, then the issues that were already there between them were exacerbated. And that's why we had a higher rate of reporting of domestic violence. But that doesn't mean, it, it just shows us actually the number of um, people that might be in 
these types of relationships, but because they don't spend as much time together during the day, they're able to continue and not, you know, report it. Mm. That brings me back to asking why why this gen, uh, gender disparity? Like uh, when gender disparity started at home, what can we do to you know recognize that in each of our homes? When there is a gender power imbalance, Dispar yes, a gender yes. power, power imbalance, imbalance. In, in our homes, what do we do about that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, for a start, we uh, need to understand that one of the key drivers of domestic and family violence is rigid gender stereotypes, mm -hmm. okay, which are basically societal expectations around what it means to be a man and what it means to exactly. be a woman, okay? And um, uh, we know that these rigid gender stereotypes put women on a lower level socially compared to men, okay? So men are considered the leaders, the breadwinners, strong, affable, respected, and women have the softer role of the nurturer and the caretaker. And sometimes, some men, and this creates a power imbalance, mm -hmm. okay? And sometimes, some men uh, believe that that power imbalance, that inequality, makes it okay to disrespect women and their partners. And they might do that in the home. And this is not okay. Okay? And it starts with disrespect, all right? And sometimes that disrespect can turn into very serious violence, physical violence. Okay? That power imbalance, to maintain that power imbalance, can turn into physical violence. And sometimes, in the worst case scenario, it turns into homicide. Beautiful. Well said. Continuing with uh, what Penny was mentioning. This disrespect, now it should be acknowledged that men and women are, are different, right? But what is important is respect towards each other. Now when that respect is missing and things are taken for granted and exactly like what Penny was mentioning, because of uh, the social connections and social societal pressure, there's um, like you're raised in this belief that men are superior and women are inferior, mm. all that. So when you are raised in that and you see all your growing up years, you have seen your parents, your uncles, your grandfathers and everybody uh, following the same pattern, you see there's nothing wrong in there. So what needs to change is bringing respect into your relationship, no matter who it is, even children, respect. When you have that respect, slowly that language changes, the attitude changes, the behavior changes. Yeah, I think the education should start from your home. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, it should. absolutely. Right. Um, my next question would be to Dr. Primna. Uh, Dr. Primna, um, almost 10 women are hospitalized uh, for assaults and injury by their spouse or partners. Uh, when this happens, uh, does a patient come to you and actually reveal that you know there's been a, a case of domestic violence, or is it usually that you have to, um, you know, find the subtle trait, you know, aspects of domestic violence, and do you have to bring it up? So I've seen numerous like domestic violence victims over the years. So of the majority would be like the major OC population, and people do come up and tell you that like they do suffer from all these things at home and if there's something to be done about that that's a general population but if you're talking about a culturally we call the call which is a cultural and linguistically diverse community that is like the ethnic communities females from ethnic communities ever come and talk to you about family violence no they never so even if somebody comes in with like a lot of beating bruised and bashed and you can recognize it's possibly the physical abuse and you ask them and they would make up stories which you would know outright they're lying but they make up stories to protect their spouse or the family member and to come and talk about like these are the things that's going at home and asking for help or even revealing that that never happens from 
ethnic minorities. Hmm. Uh, so what, what kind of assistance as a GP uh, do you first provide uh, people who are victims of domestic violence? How, how, do we, how do we take it from there? So many people like you get kind of an inkling that, okay, these things kind of point towards, they might be like getting abused, all the different kind of abuse. You put out like feelers out, like ask them questions to check if they would kind of, you know, respond because they sometimes they could be just looking for an opening, somebody to recognize it so they can like ask for help and talk more about it. It works. Some, for those who doesn't like, you know, reveal that, okay, I, I'm a victim of domestic violence, but you know that's probably happening, then it could be like telling them, educating them about like, see, these kind of things are normal, accepted, but these are not accepted. Do you want to think about whether something of this might be happening to you? If yes, it takes a lot of courage to talk about it. Like, so have a thing, come back, tell them, make them aware of what is domestic violence and then tell them that there is kind of help available but it won't happen in like one conversation one consult encourage them to come back and see you again and then we explore more and then kind of you know uh, tell the different things that could do like also like meanwhile assessing always assess the risk because sometimes they would be minimizing it but Sometimes it could be just like that one port of call and you don't respond and the next thing you hear could be like a violent homicide or that kind of thing. So you always do assessment. Professionals know how to do that risk assessment and then if it's not acutely risky, you develop that rapport, ask them to come back and lead them into things like, you know, what the other uh, people were mentioning, like uh, uh, Safe Steps or Bethany or that kind of linking with different professional organizations. Does the referral happen from a GP or how, how does that go about? So things like calling uh, the white ribbon or one 800 uh, respect you don't need a referral so they can pick up the phone and call these services and which is like many people don't know that like asking for domestic violence help it's like a it's a non they don't have to pay because that's one of the things that could be putting off people from ethnic minority groups that they don't have money to pay but they don't need payment they can pick up the phone and call and then it also doesn't depend on the residency status so they can ask for help and if you're getting getting help for domestic violence that actually literally could help towards getting your own residency separate from your apartment visa so People can look up these numbers with the doctors can provide them, but things like Safe Step or White Ribbon, Bethany, Orange Door, these are all like the voluntary or NGOs. And when with government support, they are all there for these victims. So you don't need a doctor's referral. You can even just ring up the call, call them up, even do online chatting and ask for help. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pramna. I'm sure that our audience would benefit from that bit of info. Um, back to the two of you. Uh, the one biggest problem that I have often felt that, you know, the community has is taboo. Uh, to speak up against domestic violence or, you know, to even say that there is a problem at home because uh, it's considered, oh, um, uh, maybe I'm doing something that's not right, which is why things are not perfect at home and, you know, things are going other ways because of that. And then there is a big society that you need to, you know, show off in front of and it's, it's embarrassing or it's, um, it's a shame to even talk about uh, something that's going wrong at home. So most often I've seen that, you know, if people have kept it uh, to themselves, it's because of the, the taboo that they face within the society. Even when they have uh, moved out of their cultural zones and you know, moved, migrated into another land, the ethnic community still has that uh, concern when it comes to what would the society think. How can we uh, help people who have this kind of a concern? I think it is there. Uh, everybody, and until 
this relationship actually explodes, not even close friends would come to know about it. Because to the outside world, everything looks hunky-dory, very, very beautiful and the most beautiful relationship. Now, I think the only way to get people to come forward uh, or to take action is awareness. And that is what our role is as White Ribbon Community Partners, to make people aware and check the relationship, uh, whether it is in the right direction, whether it is the right, right kind of relationship. And if there's something wrong, if there are red flags, then raise that and see. The main, main thing is security. Are you secure? So ultimately, like uh, what Penny was mentioning and your question, Shama, is leading to, is it leading to uh, physical injury or homicides or emotional trauma or everything, anything that is bad, is it leading towards that? Or if you can recognize the depth of the relationship early on, then um, call it out. That's, that's, and yeah, so that's what it is. Well, Dr. Primna was just updating on um, how one has the you know, option to call 1-800-RESPECT or the Orange Door or Safe Steps or um, White Ribbon. Uh, in, in a line of order, what would you think is the first thing that you know, somebody needs to know if they feel or they doubt that they're going through domestic violence? Um, <clears throat> so you mentioned the, those numbers, the, the helpline numbers, 1-800-RESPECT and Lifeline and Safe Steps, all of... There are many, many services that are available to both men and women, right, to both men and women. So sometimes, you know, you might be a male who knows that you're in a relationship and you're being controlling and you want to stop your behaviour. Exactly. Okay? And you might need help. So these services are available to both men and women, okay? Um, and they're, they're anonymous. The services are anonymous. You can speak to somebody about your circumstances and you can get help and advice about what is the next best step. Um, sometimes uh, there is this social stigma and taboo. That's why it's called the silent pandemic because people feel ashamed about admitting that there is a problem in their relationship. But there is help out there for people through these different services they can speak to somebody and they can get not only emotional, psychological help, but they can also get physical support. So Safe Steps provide crisis support to people who might be in a scenario where they don't have a job. They can be set up in a home, in a refuge for a period of time. And if they don't feel safe, they, there is always somewhere to go. There is always an option for, pe for women who are in a scenario where they don't feel safe. There is always an option, okay? And those numbers that you mentioned are available and you can ring and talk to people anonymously. It's very safe. You can have a conversation and tell people your story and understand what is the next best step for you. There's, <laughs> yeah. Um, just to, as a prelude to uh, the, what Penny was mentioning, first look at the safety. Yeah. If unsafe, the first thing to call is triple zero. And all the other, num other numbers would come after that. In the sense, like if you are safe, then all the other, uh, the 1-800 respect and safe steps and life, uh, lifeline and men's referral services and all that would come if the environment is safe. Safe in the sense there's no physical threat, there's no murder, there's no injuries and all that kind. So if that is evident or if that is coming, uh, then triple zero is the first number you would contact, right? Um, there was another thing which I wanted to say, but... <laughs> That's okay. But um, there's another question that I would like to touch upon. Uh, domestic violence within the family is often forgiven as long as there is no physical abuse involved, uh, especially when it comes to ethnic um, community groups. There, there's there's often, um, you know, brushed aside and said, hey, he's not hurt you, you're, you're you know, still good, you know, yeah, and everything's uh, still, you know, fine, as long as there is no physical violence. Uh, is this something that we can still tolerate? Because uh, uh, you did mention that there is coercive control, which is a part of being, you know, ab uh, abused uh, in a relationship. How long should one, you know, 
cling on or stay on uh, in hopes of this relationship going in the right direction? I can probably add, and you can join the opinion. I would say there is no definite black and white answer to that because each case is different, mm -hmm. each relationship is different. Yeah. So there is no black and white, okay, has it been six years? All right, then now it's time to check. There is nothing <laughs> like that. Uh, or whatever number of years, or even if, as I said, in the other couple, or oh, we, we've been together for 30 years, so now everything is fine, no. So there is no time limit to that. It is an intuition what each person goes through that is it, is it right. It's a question they have to ask themselves. The other thing to consider is that we do know that when children are raised in an environment where there is coercive control and abuse, then the children experience abuse themselves as well Beautiful. as observers in that environment. So if you're in a relationship, in a marriage, where there, is, there are abusive behaviours, and, you know, there is still that... Sorry, but yeah. I, I had to interrupt because that was exactly the question I wanted to ask you. Because uh, there are people out there who would say, hey, as long as it's not affecting the entire family, it's all right. You know, the abuse is only towards me. And um, for the sake of my children, I'll, I'll decide to stay in this relationship. So, yes, for, for women out there who, you know, feel this, this answer from Penny is exactly what you need to listen to. Yes, Benny, go for it. <laughs> so we know there is, there is statistical evidence that there is a direct link between an abusive relationship and children feeling abused and then going on to have an abusive relationship themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so there is a direct link. So um, it's the impact of abuse is far-reaching, okay? not only for the two people who are in the relationship, but for everybody involved, okay? And it is a, 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 a misconception that staying in the relationship is good for the children. It's actually the opposite is truth, okay? When the relationship is abusive, it's, it is detrimental to the well-being of the children. That is very essential for, you know, for the women out there who really need to know this part uh, because most of them, you know, continue in a relationship because they think that is the most safest option for their children. And it is... Uh, Societal pressure. Yes. What will people say? Yes. Uh, there are sometimes, you know, uh, uh, societal pressures in terms of friends saying that it's still all right, you know, let's just hang in there. But I guess this awareness has to be uh, brought about uh, for the community at large. You know, it's not just one person speaking up for the other or not just, you know, a couple of people raising their voice. It's as a community, all of us together needs to raise this awareness. And yes, and, and also, um, you know, this notion that, um, you know, but what are people going to say? Um, so. So it's, it's really important that we are aware of the impact of the choice to stay because of that. Right. Um, because the impact on the family is, is detrimental. It's, it, yeah, and, 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 you know, people might talk, the community might talk for a week or two weeks, but your children are impacted for the rest of their lives. Yeah, we're looking at the future. We're, we're looking at the next generation and we do not want to uh, give them any message that would you know, be detrimental to their future. That's um, a great remark, uh, Penny. And um, I think it's been wonderful having the three of you on the panel today. And I'm sure our viewers would have definitely benefited from this um, uh, discussion that we've had about domestic violence and the uh, flags that you have to be aware of. Um, what would you be your closing remark to the audience of M4TV, Penny? Um, my closing remark would be that um, if you notice somebody that you know uh, that might be struggling in any way in a domestic violence type scenario, offer them your support and let them know that there is help available. 
um, it, not in a not in a not, not with pressure, but offer them your support and let them know that help is available. Okay, and and remember that there are many many services available to people. Um, there's one eight hundred respect. There's Lifeline. There's Safe Steps. Um, if you go to your general pa practitioner, they can they can talk to you about about options. So if any of this resonates, if you if you're concerned in any way, and if any of this resonates, or if you know somebody who might be in this type of scenario, then um, you can you can approach them and offer your support and 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 talk to them about what is available to them in terms of where they can go to get help. Lovely, thank you, um, Ajay. As a community partner for White Ribbon Australia, um, you have vowed to stand up against violence against women. Uh, so here's your chance to address tens and thousands of MPTV viewers, man to man. What do you have to say? <laughs> All the men out there, and men and boys, stand up, speak out to end violence against women. Violence in general, right? Now, there's also another point which I wanted to make, which is stop judging. When someone talks to you, trust them. Don't question them and stop judging them. It's all because of the dress that you wear, it is all because of your attitude, it is all because of your behavior, it is, why don't you change? Uh, well, if someone complains or when someone opens up, it is very difficult to open up and providing advice like uh, you, should, you shouldn't leave, you should stick on, uh, it's why don't you, why do, or uh, even the other, the reverse, why don't you just quit and go? Even that is not possible. Even that's not that's difficult to leave and go also. So stop giving advices and lead them to the professional counselors like what Penny and uh, Dr. Primna was mentioning. Uh, all these numbers are there. All these health helplines are there to provide support. First thing is to be aware. And closing line is it's a beautiful life. Uh, enjoy the life and there's only one life. Thank you so much, Ajay. Um, over to Dr. Pramna. Dr. Pramna, thank you so much for joining online today amongst your busy schedule. Uh, but I'd love to hear what you want to share with the viewers of Empire TV. Definitely. So I would want people like the viewers to raise this conversation, start the conversation about domestic violence at your home or your workplace or in your family or your friend circle and make them be aware of what is domestic violence and that it is happening around you. So starting that conversation and help you know people like open up and to get help. And maybe start that conversation at home so your kids kind of know how to behave respectfully to the opposite gender and that they won't become perpetrators in future. And if you know somebody, a friend or a colleague or a family member suffering, give them that courage to speak up and get professional help. And if you recognize someone is in danger, ask them to leave. Don't ask them to stay in the marriage for the sake of the kids. No, ask them to leave if they are in danger. So take this message and spread the awareness and let's create like a safe society for all the females out there. To all the men, there are your next generation is watching you. Whether it is your sons, whether it is your nephews, your friends, sons or whoever it is, the next generation is watching all of us men out there. So be a role model, do the right thing. So that if we need to change the culture, it will take at least another two or three generations. When they grow up in a safe and positive environment, the kind of life that they would lead would, would help, will make their lives easier, happier, and then it goes on and on. And that is the only way we can change this entire culture of family violence. So men, take responsibility, take accountability, and be a role model for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. That was beautifully said. 
Thank you so much, all of you. Um, I'd like to borrow from Ajay's line and say, um, let's keep a safe place and you know a violence-free uh, space for everyone around us, uh, not just the women, just everybody around us. Um, and I think it's a beautiful world, like you said, and we need to just yeah. embrace it. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful life. Let's embrace it. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us on this uh, panel discussion against domestic violence. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you at the studio at M4TV today. Thank you, thank you very Shama. much, Shama.